Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Sydney Coach Replay Show. I'm Corey Camp, your host, and today we bring back Allison Burnett, our director of our virtual learning and our, our virtual coaching services here at Sydney. Uh, to really kind of continue this conversation on sharpening our saw. You know, last time we talked about um, in part two, how we can use research-based sentence stems that cause teachers to be receptive and reflective. Part one, we focused on the three zones of learning, um, but we know that it's so important that we ourselves as instructional leaders continue to grow and, and sharpen ourselves so we can help others do the same in their work. So today, part three, the final part, we're going to focus on the importance of coaches reflecting on their coaching conversations. So Allison, I'm so excited to talk about this. We've got some great resources and welcome back to the show. Thanks, Corey. I'm excited to be here. I'm a little sad. It feels like it's, you know, the end of our work. In this no, we'll have another thing. You'll come back for another thing. <laughs> I promise. I promise. I promise. Uh, yeah, I, I do think this is important, you know, as we're rounding up the school year, right? My kids um, finished their school year uh, virtually online this this week. I know many other schools have already wrapped up their uh, year or are in the process of doing that in the, the next few weeks. And um, we know as educators, the learning doesn't stop here. In fact, our role as instructional leaders ramps up a little bit uh, as the summer begins and we start helping others, you know, providing professional learning. Many people are figuring out how to do that virtually. We talked about that last week with Stephanie Affinito. Um, so yeah, so I think this is the perfect part to come back and talk a little bit, especially on what you're going to talk about today. So I'm super excited. So I'll let you kind of take it away and get right into it. Okay, very good. Thanks, Corey. So really, this whole series about sharpening our saw is really about building our awareness as coaches. And I think that awareness is the prerequisite to change. And um, I ch think that change is the prerequisite to growth. So how can we become increasingly aware as an instructional coach so that we can continue to improve? And, you know, awareness, uh, you know, that's why I don't have a scale. Because if I'm not, if, <laughs> if I don't weigh myself and I'm not aware that I've gained weight, then I don't have to make any changes to my diet, which is exactly how I want it. So, that's right. <laughs> uh, so, so it's sometimes hard. Like there's, there was a quote I saw one time that said, um, change is fun. You go first, right? <laughs> change is hard. Uh, yeah. Think of every New Year's resolution you've ever made and how long it took you before you broke it. It's hard to change. It so, sounds good, right? Like in theory, it sounds great. Like I'm going to do this and it's going to be amazing. And then you get it, you know, I'm one afternoon in and I'm already thinking of all the fast food I, I'm going to miss in this change. And let me just go have it one more time. Right. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so we have to be, we have to be intentional and we have to be uh, willing to increase our awareness around our professional practices in order to grow. In order to grow, you have to change something. Mm -hmm. And that's just the reality of it. So today we're talking about the idea of increasing our awareness around our practices by, by recording and reviewing some and being ref reflective around conversations that we're having with the teachers that we coach. Mm -hmm. So um, today I want to really bring back a, a resource that we've talked about in the past, which is keys to effective feedback. I want to add a, uh, I'm going to call it a mashup. If you ever watched the TV show Glee, you know that they would mash up two different songs. Today we're going to mm -hmm. mash up two different resources. And the first is that familiar resource, right, which is keys to effective feedback with a new resource, which is Sydney's mission cards. And there's that old, there's that one we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. So um, before we press record on that conversation, that coaching conversation we're having with our teachers, I think it's important for us to review the research around um, what, what good feedback looks like. And there, therefore, we can almost create a, a, a list of look-fors. So before I record that conversation, I want to have some ideas in mind of the things I should be doing. And then when I watch that, when I watch that video, I can have some look-fors and I can then say to myself, okay, did I, was I aligned with these things? Where wasn't I aligned? And there's my, there's my sweet spot for growth. So let's go ahead and get started then by looking at the keys to effective feedback and specifically in that in kind of in the middle of that page, feedback essentials. 
So before I press record and I start recording that coaching conversation, I want to remind myself of the importance of having um, goal-referenced feedback. And you know, one of the big mistakes we make in coaching practices is that we as coaches want to fix everything as quickly as possible and leave no stone unturned because we're very, very efficient, right? And, and so we get, I think, bogged down by focusing on too many goals uh, at some times. And for you to bring up that illustration of the, of the golfing scenario. So, um, you know, if I go to take a golf lesson and it's say it's a 45 minute golf lesson and at the end of that lesson, I have all these ideas in my head of what my coaching instructor told me to do. And I have taken, uh, you know, tennis lessons and, and other athletic lessons and I have had a coach tell me a lot of things to keep in mind. I can tell you that at the end of that lesson, uh, I wasn't very likely to be able to do any of those things at all. Whereas if the coach had said, hey, let's just focus on three key things here in this first lesson, and that would be, you know, how to hold the golf club, how to address the ball, and how to keep your head down as you, as you strike the ball. If we did those three things for 45 minutes, I think I'd have a lot of success versus trying to, the coach telling me all of these things that maybe a professional golfer learns and becomes ultimately intuitive in them and part of their muscle memory right? Mm -hmm. But we have to be careful then to have that goal reference feedback with clear results and not to have too many goals involved. So one of the things I'm looking for when I'm looking at my video of my coaching conversation, Corey, is going to be, um, did I keep a narrow field and were my goals, the goals that we discussed, were they, were they tangible and results oriented? Well, and I just, I just want to respond to a little bit of, of what you've just said in, First of all, this is exactly what coaching for my husband to me looks like the first time we went out golfing. He loves golf and he's been doing it for years. And this is also the, that was the same day that I quit golf. Um, I've got these clubs. My son has asked to take over because he's like, you never use them. And I'm like, well, you go golfing with your dad one time and let's see, see how that works for you. Um, but, but it really is um, important to kind of keep that narrow field. And, and you're right. As as instructional coaches, part of what I think that prerequisite that got us into this role is that we are problem solvers and that we can identify and look objectively, you know, and critically at a, a situation and identify some holes and possible areas for improvement. And um, it's still the thing that, you know, after 12 years of coaching, I'm still really making sure I'm cognizant of because it can get away from me and I can do this. I can send an email to a teacher after an observation and say, here's all the things, you know, um, and, and maybe you just want to pick one. Um, how do I pick one out of all of this? Right. So that is, that is a great look for in our feedback is making sure that we, um, kind of make some decisions about that. And that's one of my favorite things we, when we talked in the, the last two episodes is, especially if you're using video and maybe a platform like Sydney, hopefully Sydney, um, you're able to look at that feedback before you, your coachee receives it, right? And to say, all right, I, I put down all the things, all of my thoughts, but now let me kind of look at the, this through the frame of what our ultimate goal is. Um, what are some of those things that I, I can maybe put in my back pocket for a future goal? Um, you know, what's going to be most important for the teacher in this? Because I'm not the only one in this coaching partnership. So um, I think that's a really, really good reminder within our feedback. And Corey, that leads us into really the next step under the feedback essentials. If we'll jump back to that, that takeaway, and that is to make sure our feedback is actionable, that it's concrete and specific. It's not too abstract. It's something that's doable and observable. Otherwise, um, um, otherwise I don't think it's going to be quite as effective. So as I'm recording that coaching conversation, I'm going back to my look for's. Did we come up with goals that were actionable, concrete, and specific? Uh, that leads us to the third uh, bullet, and that is making sure that our goals are user-friendly. And one of the things that makes our goals user-friendly is that we're not using uh, feedback that is, has highly technical terms. So let me give you an example. When Robert Marzano's classroom instruction that works first came out way a long time ago, 
It was the it was the book everybody was reading and the nine high yield strategies. We all memorized what those were. And, and when I would do presentations, I would always try to refer to a few of those nine high yield strategies. And so so I would re reference the one that um, I think had the most technical terms in it. And it was um, uh, Marzano said that if we use non linguistic representations, we would increase student achievement. Yeah. So I can remember just rattling through that because I've become very familiar with it and having a teacher stop me and ask me what was a non-linguistic representation. It's a graphic organizer. So we have to be sure that our feedback is user friendly mm -hmm. and that uh, if we are using those technical terms that we need to make sure we're defining those for, uh, for our teachers to make sure we don't leave them behind because of lack of understanding. And then the last of these feedback essentials uh, from this particular resource is that we're consistent with our feedback. And that means, in a sense, that there's a consistency and agreement and understanding, especially if we're setting goals, on precisely and exactly what those goals are. If you ever watch, and we're going to encourage you to watch a Jim Knight video where he's interacting with a teacher as they're going through a goal setting process, at the end of that, as that video ends, it's, it's almost as if Jim Knight is asking that teacher, let's write this goal down together. Is this what the goal is? Do you agree that's what the goal is? Do you agree if we were successful in achieving that goal that we really have accomplished something? Yes, I agree. So there was really a lot of emphasis placed on a consistent understanding between the coach and the teacher in, uh, in terms of what the goal is and what high quality and success of that goal would actually look like. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, important. And this is a key piece of maintaining good rapport with your coaches as well. If, you know, I say, I think this, this would be the most important thing to focus on. And then the next time I'm giving you another important thing to focus, it's the most important thing you should focus on, you know, or um, I, you know, I'm using a lot of technical terms, but then I'm having some trouble kind of um, making that something that's user friendly for you. It can really kind of throw off our coaches and and not only frustrate them but make them maybe doubt a little bit in our ability to um, support them maybe even come off more evaluative and so I'm less trustworthy sure. in that in in the supporting the implementation the messy middle right because it's going to be messy we're going to identify our goal and we're going to have to work towards that like you said change is hard and uh, it's not always perfect and you know there's not always the next perfect intervention or step and it never always goes swimmingly and um, for us to be really effective we have to be um, really that those individuals who can support in that messy middle that I can be the person you can turn to when it didn't quite go well I followed all the steps and it still is it doesn't seem to be working um, how can I get help in that so those are those are all really important and again that's why they're here on the essentials um, for us to think about in our feedback. All right. So Corey, I'm excited to mash this resource together with uh, a SIPI mission card. And if you'll show us that before we, before I get into um, talking about how these two re references or resources are aligned, I do want you to just in general, since you, you are the the mastermind? Are you the mastermind behind this? Co-mastermind is uh, uh, Jenny Selfridge and, and TJ and I um, took on this challenge. So yeah. Um, so, so the Sydney missions, and we have kind of two versions of these, uh, we call these cards, the Sydney mission cards. Um, you might have heard us talk about them before, especially like on our What's Up Wednesday show. A lot of our, our customers talk about them. They're one of our most popular resources on the Sydney Learning Center. Um, essentially, these missions are uh, typically video related in some way um, on how you can use video for professional learning at the teacher level, at the instructional coach or instructional leadership level, and at the primary leadership level in your organization to enhance whatever professional learning that you're doing. So just having something to be able to record yourself, a device to record, and a place to watch that isn't always enough. Um, just because I record myself teaching doesn't mean when I watch myself teaching that I'm going to see teaching and learning. I'm probably first going to see all of these things that are very personal about like how I look and how I'm dressed and what I'm doing with my hands as I'm talking um, and not teaching and learning. So how can we focus in? How can we use that video um, 
in a productive way? Where do we place the camera? What do we focus on as we watch? All of, and there's so many ways, the, the possibilities are endless. So Sydney Missions came from a uh, customer of ours out of my hometown, Magnolia, Texas, who a principal who used it on her campus. And these were just little challenges, you know, your mission should you choose to accept it this week is to take a look at your vocabulary instruction and look for these four things. And that was really beneficial for that principal's um, staff. And so we kind of took that idea and said, you know, let's, let's create several of these. So the mission, semi mission cards, there are 52 of them currently. We've got 13 more we'll release this summer. Um, they are, if you are a Sydney subscriber, you have access to the full 52 card deck. But if not, you still have access to about 10 to 15 of our cards on our sample deck. So just go to the Learning Center, look for the Sydney Missions sample deck, and you can get access to um, some of our, our top examples of Sydney Mission cards. Um, so is that a good enough introduction, Allison? That was great. <laughs> I could go on and on about these things because they really are powerful, but um, the one we want to focus on today is a coach card um, that is all about self-reflecting as a coach and um, looking at that conversation, looking at the feedback. Right, right. Yeah, so, so here's, the, here's the crossover between the keys to effective feedback and the feedback essentials and this particular mission card. What I like about the mission cards, Corey, is in the direction section, it really gives us the process to follow. If you're gonna, and this is, this is really the card that I think inspired part three, essentially, of our work together today. Mm -hmm. And that is, if you're going to sharpen your style as a coach, you really have to be willing to record those conversations, go back and listen, and see where there is room for growth. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so this gives us that process right in the direction section of the card. In this middle section of the card, the strategy section, it's really giving us, it's really adding on to those things that we saw as feedback essentials. And really, um, in a very nice way. It's very, um, it's very aligned with what we've already talked about, but I'm gonna tease apart a little bit of the, uh, some of the differences. So as we look at these strategies again, and these are things, again, before I press record in that conversation I'm having with my coach, I wanna have some look for us. So when, that, when I am reviewing that recording, what am I looking for? What are some areas that I could really, that if I made changes, could really result in me being a better coach? We've looked at those already as the essential keys to essential feedback, and now I want to look at these strategies because they add to my understanding of what I should be looking for. So the first, the first thing there is uh, the balancing of verbal and nonverbal cues. And so, you know, we know the, we know the power of body language, essentially. If we, if there's an important political speech or debate, in fact, when there are debates, we're going to see body language experts who are going to come on television and tell us what that candidate was really feeling as they addressed that question or what they were really, when they really got nervous and so forth. So body language is important. And one of the things I want to look for, Corey, as I'm reviewing my tape, is I want to see what my body language said. Mm -hmm. And we want our body language to say, I'm relaxed. We want it to say, I'm patient. And, um, you know, I think because you do a lot of trading around technology, as, as I used to, the more um, flustered a teacher, a teacher or administrator gets as they're trying to use new technology, the, the, the worse things go very, very quickly. Yeah. So we have to be patient. It's okay. We're going to be here together. You know, sometimes it's the way that I guess uh, if I'm calling into Apple support, it's the way they, it's like they're talking me down off the ledge. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Lots of people are confused about that button, and we're going to work through this. You're together. not the only one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're kidding. I thought I was the only one. Who decided <laughs> so we want we want our body language to be consistent with our verbal cues as well, and we want to watch for that. We want to look for that as we're looking at our videos. Yeah. Um, anything to add to that, Corey? Well, I would I would say also, and I'm looking here to see if it's in here, but you know, you might also take a look at the body language of your coachee if you've got yeah. them in the frame. So, the the thing about the and I I use this strategy all the time. Um, you know, I used to use it when I was doing in person coaching conversations as well as 
um, now virtually. And I'll, I'll ask if I can record our, our Zoom or Google Hangout meeting and just say, it's just for my eyes only. I'm just, I'm working on my listening skills or I'm working on my questioning strategies, just like we're working on yours in the classroom. Um, and so just like I'm asking you to use video, I want to use video as well. And so sometimes I will have the camera if I'm in person um, with my coachee, I'll have it kind of over their shoulder and it's mainly looking at me, but sometimes I'll have it kind of next to us, mostly on me. But if I can capture their body language where I can see that, you know, maybe they're, they've started to tense up or they've leaned back and folded their arms, then that helps me see how they're responding to what I'm laying down, right? So I can think a little bit differently about uh, uh, how I do that and, oh, that really maybe touched a nerve or I said that came out completely wrong and they noticed, you know? So, um, or I'm starting to see my body language tense up and I can immediately see theirs as well, right? They're feeding off of my energy. So um, definitely look at your body language, but again, just like an instruction, um, we should be responsive to our audience, our learners. And so that's a great way to look at that as well. Corey, and I know that you've mentioned this before when we're on Zoom meetings and we're working with somebody who doesn't have their camera on. Yeah. It, it really feels like I'm missing a, I'm missing a, a way to really cue into whether or not they're understanding or they're, inter, in, or they're interested or they're engaged mm -hmm. as a company, as a company. Uh, we've agreed that we're going to have our camera on so that uh, we can we feel like we're more engaged with one another. We can read one another's body language. We do know when we frustrated someone uh, mm -hmm. because they're rolling their eyes. Uh, yeah, or they uh, turn their camera off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to go take a time out. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so body language is an important look for, and we, we're going to encourage folks to look at some of the Jim Knight videos, and we're going to mm -hmm. see that the camera is angled so that we can see both Dr. Jim Knight and the teacher that he's working with, you can see both of them at the same time, which is very valuable. Mm -hmm. The next bullet is about just making sure we're practicing good listening habits. And in here, of course, um, sometimes we find ourselves listening. Uh, we're listening. We look like we're actively listening, but we're really thinking about what it is we're going to say next, right? So to be an active listener is to be, to be all in and fully there. Right? We're not picking up our cell phone and, and we're looking to the side to see what the new message was. That's not an example of being an active listener. Uh, but we're, we're, when we're actively listening, we're doing what, um, what's called giving, literally giving psychological air to someone else. Because how often do, um, do others, how often do we get the full attention, the full and undivided attention of an other human being? It's pretty a very special thing for you. So, <laughs> so we want that teacher, hopefully, as a coach, I'm conveying that idea that you are uh, front and center stage right now. You're what's most important to me. I've turned my cell phone off or I've put it to the side, and I am actively listening with the intent of hearing you and hearing you fully and giving you that psychological air that comes from having, having that feeling that I'm being listened to and what I'm saying matters and that I really care about what you're thinking. Yeah. And, and again, this is where this bullet right here is one of the areas I've had to work on most personally because I'm a talker. I don't exactly enjoy hearing myself talk, but um, I really struggle with the silence. Like I don't know what to do when there's silence. Um, with my students, I was great with wait time. Like I've, I've got pretty good wait time, but I think in a conversation where it's a little bit more um, you know, partner or peer focused, I struggle a little bit because, and it is something I worked on in my own teaching uh, because I would think the silence meant they didn't understand the question or maybe they, they don't have the background knowledge. So I'd find myself immediately um, taking up that, that space with some scaffolds for understanding or clarifying questions or ch changing the way I ask the question. I really do um, have to, this is where I have to focus the most on in my listening skills is I'm listening to what, what they're saying, but when there's a moment to pause, I feel the urge. It really is an impulse to just immediately respond instead of taking a couple seconds and waiting to see if there's more. That's why I love, um, the, uh, the coaching habits, 
uh, book by Box of Crowns, I believe it is. I'll add it to the link here in the show, but Jim Knight references it a lot as well. They've got seven questions um, that they recommend to support your coaching. And a lot of them are, you know, and what else? Yeah. And what else? Right. You just, you right. wear that puppy out until they're like, I got nothing else, Corey, stop asking me. And then, and then you kind of come in with, with your uh, two cents, if that's appropriate or, you know, clarifying a little bit. So when you say this, you, you're, what you're saying is, um, so, so this is really, again, um, as coaches, our time, sometimes if we feel rushed, this is also where I would struggle because I'm, oh yeah, yeah, I hear you. So here's what you can do to, to fix that and anything else I can help you with today. Um, that is not that partnership time coaching. So there's a, there's a place for that, that more directive piece. But um, again, thinking about your goals with that coachee and where they are and everything, this is the part where you can really, and if you're using video, you can, you can use a stopwatch or a timer to kind of note uh, the time in which that you spoke or um, that there was some dead air, which is totally okay for them to have that space to speak freely. So let's go to the next one, which is just, we're looking at the kinds of questions we're asking. This goes back to, actually back to the piece of effective questioning because we talked about those sentence stems, Corey, and we said, hey, if you use if you begin your feedback with these sentence stems, these research-based sentence stems, we're more likely to get a, a coachee who is going to be reflective. They're not going to feel like we're judging them or attacking them. We're really curious. And I think that's a part of that listening too, and that body language is we really do need to be curious. We really do need to understand what they were thinking at, at, at different times. And I so I love the use of these stems once again as part of our questioning. Being sure we're asking those open-ended questions versus those closed questions where it's, we're gonna get a yes or no answer. Being sure we're not leading the witness too, too deeply in the direction mm -hmm. um, uh, that we might want them to go, but not being judgmental, those kinds of things are there with our questioning strategies. Yeah. Um, and so just very quickly then, uh, coaching conversations, um, uh, who did most of the thinking in the conversation? You know, I like, I always refer back to Harry Wong. If you've ever, if you ever saw Harry Wong mm -hmm. present, he would talk about who's doing most of the work and, and how you know who's doing most of the work is at the end of the day, when teachers leave the school building, they're dragging, they can barely make it to their cars. They're so tired and exhausted and the bell rings and the kids are running out of the building and jumping and laughing, and playing, and twirling and skipping and singing and so it's clear who did most of the work during the school day, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to be sure that we are setting it like a good full, full shot, right? We're setting the teacher up to do the, the most of the thinking within the session and making sure that through our questioning, we're allowing that to happen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And again, this is where you can, that video becomes a really powerful resource because sometimes my, my notes from the conversation don't always tell me those things and it's hard to see. And that these are, you know, this thinking is what you see and hear in that video footage. It's, it's that body language where you can see that they're kind of thinking it's, it is those moments of silence where we're giving some space for processing and reflection before they get to respond. And then it is in what they say and how they respond to that. So um, I, I really think you can maybe do this without video, but video really is going to be your most effective, most powerful tool for being able to see some of these big look fors that we've talked about today. Right. I mean, I certainly could get, I'm sure, the transcript from Jim Knight's conversations with teachers, mm -hmm. but seeing it on the video is more powerful. And I think also, if I'm recording myself, as we've talked about many times, Corey, video is it is objective, it is reality, right? There's no wiggle room there. It either happened or it didn't. Mm -hmm. I either talked too much or I didn't. I, so, so that's why we love the use of video. I think it really cuts to the chase. <laughs> yeah, it really does, it really does. And, and it helps us kind of capture those things that are in the moment and hard to reflect on. Um, hard to have that, that memory recall or no. their bias within our own perceptions that we bring. Um, to that recall. So yeah, definitely the best, the best tool. Um, so, so I think this is a really great mashup of those two resources, right? So I can, I can use the first one, um, both in the written feedback and kind of reflection that might happen on the video or, or alongside an observation, but then 
that li- I should also have a live conversation that follows up that written feedback, you know, dialogue that happens. Um, hopefully that's, a, that's back and forth dialogue. And then we have a, a live conversation to just tie up some loose ends, clarify understanding, share some final thoughts and resources and identify next steps. And this is a great, another great opportunity to reflect and, and grow in our own uh, coaching, coaching skills. Yeah, Corey, so that really leads us to, so what do I, so I, so I, I use the video to increase my awareness. I have these look for ready to go. I record the session and then I review that session looking for areas where I might make some improvements. And that's, we have to be intentional about that. We have to, and again, not taking, um, not being overly critical of ourselves. We're not perfect. And thinking about, and I like Jim Knight's peers role, it's like thinking, really thinking, find the difference that makes the difference. Mm-hmm. What of all the things I could work on to improve, really, what is the priority? What's really going to have the biggest impact on the teacher I'm working with? And that might be my starting point. And then, Corey, I might look for patterns. I, mm-hmm. might, I might videotape sessions with various, various teachers and look for habits and patterns that aren't, aren't suiting me well, knowing what I know about the research. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Not, this is not a one-time thing, and then you just move forward the rest of the year knowing that I need to keep an eye on this. But it is something that you should do with, you know, multiple times with with the same coachee, but also other coaches, because we might engage with a veteran teacher differently than we do a first-year teacher. And you know, some of our first-year teachers come with a little bit more of the art of teaching um, than, you know, maybe the science and some need a, need a lot, lot more help in the art part. So we f- might find ourselves responding to that need differently. So um, this is absolutely something that every opportunity I get, I record just in case. I always yeah. ask if it's okay if I record. And then, you know, I used to do this in my own classroom instruction when I did reflection, I'd record all week long. And then on Friday, I had some time set out where I would pick a day, pick a lesson, pick something that I had recorded, something short, and I would watch that back because it was most intriguing because it was an awesome moment or it was frustrating to me. And I really wanted to go back and see how I can change that or the kids seem frustrated. So um, I think the more you can record, the more opportunity you have then to reflect when you have that time and that space and want to, as opposed to, gosh, I really should have recorded that because I, I could have gone, but I could tell I needed to do something differently, but I don't know what yet. So Always having that camera on, uh, I think, it is is the better way to go. So, well, let me just say this, Corey, too, is like I've committed the biggest sin today because, you know, here I'm, I am thinking of focusing on the areas where I need to grow or improve, and totally ignoring the idea that video also provides me what other opportunity? Opportunity to celebrate the the good, right? To wit- be a witness to the good, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's, it's more of that as well, right? There were, and that was why I fell in love with video in the first place. You know, fortunately I had a couple good things going on. Now those were things that weren't things that I like, they were not plan A on my lesson plan as a teacher. I was like, okay, well that was, that's not going well. Ooh, but that was a good move. Um, I should use that more often. But then there were also some things that I I wanted to work on and you're going to see that. That's why it's so hard. So making sure that you are looking for where are your strengths? Um, you know, where, uh, are some things that, you know, that phrase or the way that I, uh, you know, started that line of questioning or how I, I clarified that worked really well. I had, I got a good response from my coachee. I should use that more often. So taking note of those things so you can build consistency in the right ways, I think is important. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anything else on, on kind of these topics here, Allison, for looking at using video, turning the camera on ourselves, uh, as coaches and instructional leaders to grow anything else for our audience? No, I think we should just give them some tasks. Yeah, there we go. There we, we go. Call it home, home fun. If it were, we were in the classroom, but we'll give them some, some home fun. Uh, tasks. Yeah. Yeah. So what would those tasks be Allison? Well, I'd like, Corey, I'd like for them to, uh, we can share with them uh, how they can access the Gym Night uh, resources so they can watch those videos. Mm-hmm. And I think it'd be fun for them to take this list of look-fors that we've created by matching up these two resources as they're watching Jim, because I'm going to tell you, he checks all the boxes. He, he does it. He's the gold standard here mm-hmm. for us. 
just by watching Jim, you're going to learn, you're going to learn some moves uh, as well. But I'd like for us to share this and, and as, as home fun, I'd like for folks to commit to, and there's the one video I think is uh, a starting point there is video 2.1. Uh, Krista uses video to get a clear picture of reality. Mm -hmm. And it's a short video. Watch the video, get your look for list out and see the ways that Jim addresses each and every one of these things that we should be trying to perfect <laughs> or trying to improve as, mm -hmm. as coaches is a great model. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, now's the time to kind of dig in and dive in and Maybe you haven't been recording yet. So these videos here that you can find from the Impact Cycle resources. So if you go to uh, the Gym Knights Instructional Coaching site, we'll put the link to this specific page from the Impact Cycle, the videos here, but um, tons of really great resources, the peers goal, some, some checklists and frameworks for you to use if you um, haven't used those yet by uh, Gym Knight. But these videos are also, you know, like watching models of, of how it looks is a perfect way to start. And then once you're back into that coaching role and doing some of these coaching conversations, you can ha have that already under your belt and start to reflect on your own practice. So, um, but if you've got videos, this might be where you go back to a, a video from the beginning of the year and then, and then end of the year and start to do a little reflection on your own e examples from your own recordings. Yeah. So um, you'll find this home fun and links to all of these things uh, in our Sydney Coach Replay notes and takeaways. So if you go to learn.sydney.com, let me uh, go there right now, learn.sydney.com. <clears throat> you will find it's the very first option when you scroll down on our resources, the Sydney Coach Replay notes and takeaways. All of our notes and takeaways from all of our episodes are here. So if you wanna go back and look at any of the episodes we had with Allison, you'll find them under episode downloads. Um, and you can access not only the uh, resource that we shared on the keys for effective feedback, part two, of three from our episode 33, but any of the other ones. You can also watch any of our other videos from the Coach Replay show um, right here uh, through our, our YouTube playlist or on our Facebook page. Allison, it was great talking with you about this. I know you and I could talk about this all day long, so we'll spare everybody else the conversation. We'll take it off offline, and um, thanks again for joining us again for the Coach Replay Show. It's not the last time you'll be on okay. here. Yeah. We'll have another series. I like this series. I like this balance. kind of slow balance of, of sharing that information and sharing those ideas. If you've got questions for Allison or I or any of our instructional coaches here at Sydney, post them in the comments below, send us a message, make sure you like and follow us on social media so you can get notifications on the next time we go live, whether it's the Sydney Coach Replay Show or any of our other great resources. Allison, have a great day and audience tune in next week for another episode of the Sydney Coach Replay Show. Thank <music> you.